Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. On the behalf of uh, Shokal Khan Memorial Cancer Hospital team, I am uh, privileged to welcome you all in this session. Today in the morning, we have pediatric oncology session. We have three talks with a focus on the acute myeloid leukemia, related to refractory Hodgkin lymphoma and the late effects. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Ahmed Nakbi. Uh, and uh, me and uh, Dr. Tari Ghaffour will host the first session. So I'm just waiting for the Dr. Tari Ghaffour <laughs> to come and join me, and then we will start the session. Thank you. Our first talk is on the updates in the pediatric acute myeloid leukemia. Dr. Ahmed Nagbi is uh, very well known in the pediatric oncology community. Uh, he is a graduate. Uh, he did his post graduation from the Aga Khan Medical, uh, from the Aga Khan Hospital, and then did his uh, fellowship uh, from the Canada. And he has special interest in the leukemia and in the HLH. Now, over to Dr. Nagbi, please. Very much. Let me just uh, share. Uh, is my screen there? Yes. Yes, we can see. Okay. Is it in the uh, in the display mode or is it in the speakers mode? What do you see there? Hello. Dr. Nakwi, you can't see your slideshow. We are able to see your slides, but please change it to the slideshow. Oh, that I have, I have done that. Yeah. So this is this is the slideshow that you are you are seeing. Are you seeing my slide? The pediatric we, acute myeloid leukemia. The title slide. We can see your slides. Can you zoom in to the slide if that's easier? At the bottom right corner, there is a zoom option. Okay, right. Bottom right corner, the zoom option is for. Do you see my notes as well, or do you only? No, see we can't slide? see. So, we the slides are very small, so you need to go to the presenter mode, like exit the presenter mode, and then pay, play from the beginning. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, let me do that. Sorry about that. Okay, okay, I think this is good enough. We can start. Okay, right. So let me now. Uh, there is a it. use presenter mode at the bottom. You, you see at the top of the screen, there is a use presenter mode with a checkbox next to it. If you can just unclick that just checkbox. Sorry, which, uh, which one are you saying? So there is resolution. So you see at the top of the screen, there is resolution, show present presentation on, and then there's a use presenter view. If yeah, you can un okay. unclick that, uncheck it. There we go. Yeah. So now you can go to slideshow. Yeah, I am go on slideshow, the... but... From beginning, there we go. Can you click that? All right, yeah, I but... think we can see your screen oh. and we can see the slides, so please go ahead. I, I, will, I will have to do it. Uh, yeah, let me, let me do it from the beginning. Okay, now do you see in a, in a good size or is still smaller? Hello? Yes, please start, uh, Dr. Nakhi, please start your presentation. Okay, so are you seeing the first slide? Yes, we can see. The title slide, okay. So I'm thankful to, of course, the organizers of the symposium for the kind invitation. Uh, I was, uh, are you seeing the disclosures or are you seeing the first slide? So we can see disclosure. Oh no, this there is there is a first slide as well. Now, do you see the first slide now? No, you are not. You are not seeing my actual slide that I wanted to. I don't know why. Because I done it from. Yes, the now we can see your first slide. Okay, okay. So because that will be easier for me. 
Yeah, so I was looking forward actually to travel to the shower and uh, present in person, but uh, unfortunately, I had booked my flights about a couple of months ago, but because of some issues uh, with PIA flights, uh, then I had to uh, cancel my travel plans. And to make an ambience uh, for myself uh, of Shokat Khanum Cancer Symposium, I could only put pictures of uh, some of the meetings that I had the pleasure to attend uh, in past. So most of the people I hope in these pictures are in the audience uh, this morning. So these are my disclosures. I am on the advisory board and speakers bureau for Jazz Pharmaceutical, and uh, it is uh, uh, the company. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Nakvi, slides are not moving. Oh, slides are not moving. Uh, how do I do that then? Because I have moved the slide and. No. Do you see now? No. Dr. Nakhvi, oh. alaikum. it's Halima here. What you yeah. need to do is go up to the slideshow tab. On the right, there is a use presenter view. Uncheck that. Okay. Your slideshow ke tab mein, go to the right. Yes, uncheck okay. it. Now go to the bottom and use this uh, slideshow right in the right low, left lower corner. Do you see right, now? Lower, right lower corner. Right, <laughs> yeah. okay. Near Zoom. There's a slideshow icon that you need to click on. Go lower. Here? To the bottom of the, yes. Click on that. Yeah. Nahi yeah, that's what I did. Okay. C can we run, do we have a slides? Yeah. We have your slides here. Do you want us to run them from here? Yeah, sure you can, but there probably will be a little bit of change in the side, but that's okay. If you could, if you could, because they are not moving. I am moving from here, but they are not changing. Okay, I'm still readable. Slides are getting over, na? Slides are getting over. Yahan se main kar raha hoon, lekin aage nahi hoon. I can end show. I have unchecked the presenter view, and uh, I have gone from. No, you don't. Now it's working. It's working now? Okay, let me try. Start. Are you doing from there? Okay, uh, Dr. Nakhvi, please start your presentation. We will move your slides from here. Okay, so you can move to the next slide. Okay. This will be difficult actually because each time, yeah, now you are getting, I don't know, this is again the same title slide that you are seeing. Next slide, please. It's not moving there as well. Because I see my title slide only. Okay, good. Now you can see this. Actually. Now, yeah, we're good. Please start now. I think, yeah. Yeah, so that's, I was saying that uh, this is the thing that I created for myself so that I feel myself in the symposium. Anyhow, so now, now you see my disclosures as well. Yeah, so these are the disclosures. So I'm on the advisory board for uh, Jazz Pharmaceutical, which makes uh, 
one of the medicines that I will be discussing in this uh, talk, which is CPX351, uh, which is uh, actually being used now in the current COG trial. And I'm also a consultant for SOBI, which makes uh, medicine for HLH, which is imapalumab. Now, this is my actually list that I thought I would be able to go through uh, in the next 25 minutes, but uh, probably not. So I will be very quick in going through uh, on as many as uh, those topics as I can, but for sure not uh, myeloid leukemia of Down syndrome because that itself is quite a big topic. Uh, I knew that there, will, there are probably uh, uh, in the audience from very junior trainees to senior consultants and uh, um, professors even. So I thought for the benefit of some of my junior colleagues, I will give a little bit of uh, 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 basics about the childhood cancer. So this, um, this uh, slide shows you the uh, incidence and mortality of children under 20 years of age. Uh, in the uh, US, and this is from SEER. So SEER actually uh, collects data, data from 20 different registries and uh, that, that uh, uh, encompasses about half of US population. So the, the incidence of pediatric cancers, which was in like four decades ago, it was 14 per 100,000. Now it is about 20 per 100,000. But the good thing is that the mortality also is going down. And it in, uh, in the same period, it has gone down from five to almost two per 100,000. So this is the breakup of the pediatric cancers that you see. So co most common, of course, are the leukemia lymphomas of almost 48%. This is, these are the Canadian data. And the central nervous system uh, is uh, tumors are 17% and the rest are brain tumors. So coming to the topic for today, acute myeloid leukemia, it uh, arises from leukemia stem cells as the other leukemia do. And it is of course, tonal expansion of the myeloid blast cells. Uh, most of the time, the disease is de novo, but some of the cases are secondary to diseases like myeloproliferative neoplasms or myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, it is the, uh, second most common leukemia subtype in pediatric age. So if we see 100 cases of leukemia, 75 of those will be acute lymphoblastic leukemia, B and T combined. 20 will be myeloid uh, acute myeloid leukemia. 2 to 3% are uh, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia that is Philadelphia positive. And uh, 1 to 2% will be rarer varieties of leukemia that is like JMML and other um, rare uh, leukemias. The classification of uh, AML used to be uh, defined by differentiation. So it was given like numbers M0 to M7. And M0 was the uh, acute myeloid leukemia with minimal differentiation. And M1 was without maturation, etc., going up to M7. But now, uh, this is the current classification, uh, which, uh, which was uh, from WHO. Uh, in uh, which was uh, released in the WHO in 2016. And it actually based, is based on genetic abnormality. So you see that the top one is acute promyelocytic leukemia with uh, PML rara fusion, that is uh, uh, APML basically. That is not our topic today, so we will not discuss it. But the rest here that you see is acute myeloid leukemia with RUNX1, RUNX1 T1, that is translocation A21. The, Third one is inversion 16. So now it's all genetics that defines a type of uh, acute myeloid leukemia. And this is important uh, when we go down and talk more about the risk stratification, etc. So this is the, the, the AML actually is seen at all ages. And uh, you see that uh, for age 1 to 18 years, the incidence is 8 per million per year. And it increases as the age advances. And above six, uh, 60 years, it is like 170 per million per year. You see that in the first year, zero to one year, it is 15 per million. That probably is because the Down syndrome uh, myeloid leukemia is included in, in, in uh, that age group. Now, these, uh, the, uh, the AML is very different disease in adults and pediatrics. So there are many, uh, uh, I mean, uh, cytogenetics and uh, uh, molecular wise also it is different and the outcomes are also very different. So this is a busy slide, but it shows you that uh, the recently comp uh, those completed trials 
and their output. So the first two rows that you see are the data from Japanese group. And the, the, the second one, the second row that I have highlighted with, uh, with the red box, it is the last trial that they had from 2014 to uh, 2018, in which they had about 350 patients. Their event free survival was 63%, and uh, the uh, overall survival was 80%. Uh, the COG, there are two trials which have been mentioned here. The last completed trial was AAML 1031. Uh, so COG has been lacking behind a little, and their inventory survival was 46% and overall survival 60, 65%. St. Jude's, uh, again, their inventory survival is the same, like 53 54%. And overall survival is 75%. So all in all, there has been some improvement, definite improvement uh, over the last uh, like 10 years. But it's not as good as we see in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So it is very important that uh, we we assign uh, risks to uh, to these leukemia patients as we do in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So assignment of risk uh, risk actually helps us in, uh, in uh, allocating the therapies with sufficient intensity so that if there's a high risk patient, it does not, he or she does not receive an inappropriately low risk therapy or low intensity therapy and vice versa. So, uh, and the other, uh, and the other uh, important thing is that it also identifies some targetable lesions to, to incorporate in your therapy plans some targeted therapies. So what are the factors that are considered in risk assignment? So there are patient-associated factors, disease-related factors, and treatment response, That is, that, and that includes measurable residual disease or minimal residual disease, MRD. So for age, we know that uh, young patients, like children, they do better than the adolescents and uh, young adults, and those young adults actually do better than the older patients. Uh, but that actually in children between 1 to 15 years of age, the impact is not that high. There were some earlier studies where it was, uh, it was uh, seen that children below 10 years of age actually did better than those who were above 10 years. But now with the current protocol, we do not risk assign them according to, uh, to age. Ethnicity is also very important and COD has shown and that uh, the, the Caucasians, they do better than the Hispanics and the, the Afro-Americans. So, uh, at the, and the second thing is that there are, there are those specific cytogenetics and molecular changes, which are, again, uh, in some, uh, like Asian uh, patients, they have higher percentage of favorable cytogenetics as compared to patients in North America and uh, Europe. And, and that I will come up in, in a few minutes and, this, and uh, explain it more. Then the treatment response, as we have seen in uh, acute lymphoblastic and leukemia as well, that the MRD is very important at certain uh, time point in the, in the treatment. And that also I will explain in more detail. So this was the risk assignment that was done in UKMRC AML 10 and 12 trials. And uh, they had an overall survival of 80% for those favorable cytogenetics leukemia, 821 and inversion 16. And the worst ones like translocin 69 or monotomy 7, they had an overall survival of 34%. And uh, the intermediate prognosis was 56% with normal karyotypes or uh, uh, chromosome 11, Q23, or MLL rearrangement and acute uh, this, um, megakaryocytic leukemia. This is a, the, the uh, slide from Japanese group of the almost uh, more than 300 patients that they have looked at their uh, genetic profile. And as I was mentioning, this favorable one, this is RUNX1, RUNX1, T1, this is translocation H21, they are seeing in 30% patients. And this is in version 16 in 9% patients. This is like an intermediate KM2, uh, KMT2A uh, rearrange or MLL rearrange leukemias, about 17%. These are the adverse ones. And these are the novel or rare fusion that, that uh, we see. 
Here, one of the fusion is actually interesting, this CREBP, BBP, where in, in older patients, it has an intermediate prognosis, but in young, young patients, means like infants or younger patients, it actually is a very mild disease, and sometimes it regresses on its own and doesn't even need treatment. So that is how the risk assignment helps you. Now, another important uh, part, point to look at is the with three mutations. So this is the most common somatic mutation that we see in AML. And when the FRIT3 is activated, it promotes the cell survival and uh, proliferation and differentiation. And there are two types of mutations of FRIT3, internal tandem duplication and tyrosine kinase domain. In children, the first one is 10%, whereas in adults, it is about 30% of patients, they have this ITD. Uh, the tyrosine kinase domain is uh, in about 6% patients. So this is an older slide from 2007, and it shows you the outcome of those patients who have uh, FRIT3 ITD uh, um, um, positive. So these are the ones who had high allele ratio of FRIT3 ITD uh, mutation. So there the, the progression-free survival was only about 25%, whereas those who had wild type of FRIT3, it was about 60%. Then in the next uh, this slide, I'm showing you the cutoff that was taken for the allele ratio, and it was 0.4. So those patients who had an allele ratio of zero, more than 0.4, their overall survival was only 20%, whereas those who had less than 0.4, it was 71%. But now uh, COG, AAML0531 protocol, they actually, in their study, they reviewed all their patients, and it was seen that those patients who had a, a lead ratio of less than 0 0.4, uh, but had, uh, but did not have those uh, favorable mutations like NPM1 or CDP alpha, their outcome was only about 25%. Whereas those patients whose allele ratio was more than 0 0.4, but had these NPM1 and CDP alpha, their outcome was about 70%. So in the current trial of COG, the cutoff has changed and we are now taking it a cutoff of a lead ratio of more than 0.1. So this is also something very important as uh, to, to risk assign them. What is the role of MRD? So MRD of course uh, is done by many different uh, methods. So the most common method used is flow cytometry and uh, the, the other one is PCR. There are other more refined methods also, like uh, other NGS, etc. But uh, flow cytometry is the most common uh, uh, and widely applicable uh, methodology. Both these methods, they have their, uh, their um, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is that uh, uh, this uh, there is a quick rapid turnover time for flow cytometry and because it is uh, it is easily available so that is the commonest use methodology that is it has a limited sensitivity of 0.1% whereas pcr is is highly sensitive to 0.001% now for flow cytometry different treatment uh, cooperative groups they have a little different like uh, cut off as well so COG in the current trial is taking a cutoff of MRD as 0.05. <clears throat> so this is the, the effect of uh, positive and negative MRD. So again, from uh, COG protocol AAML0531, you can see that those patients out of, I think there were about 761 patients out of those, there, those who had MRD uh, negative, their disease free survival is 57%, whereas those who had MRD positive, it was only 30%, and P value was very significant. This is the overall survival. For negative patients, it is 73%, and for positive patients, it is, it is uh, 48%. This is a very interesting slide, and uh, it shows that uh, these patients here are uh, 576 patients, that is 75% of the total population, they were in molecular remission. Molecular remission was defined when the, when the blast cells were less than 5%. And 25% uh, they were uh, not in molecular remission. So their disease free survival was 55% uh, and 34% respectively. But then when MRD was done on those patients who, are MR, uh, who were uh, in molecular remission, 
uh, 80% of them, they were MRD negative and their survival was uh, uh, 59%. There are those who were, who were uh, MRD, uh, who were uh, uh, still uh, molecular uh, remission, but MRD was negative and the outcome was only 38%. Interestingly, those patients who were not in molecular remission, when MRD was done on them, those who were MRD negative, their outcome was almost the same as those with, who were in molecular remission. But those who were, uh, who were uh, whose MRD was positive, the outcome was very poor. And more so, when you see for those patients who had a persistent disease of more than 15%, when MRD was run on them, so the 28% of them was MRD negative and their outcome was 60%. So what does it tell you? It tells you that what you are seeing on morphology, all those cells are not leukemia cells. So those were actually hematogons, which were counted as, as uh, blasts. So that is the importance of MRD as well, that, that you do not uh, actually count leukemia, uh, uh, the, the cells as leukemia cells. Uh, this slide shows you that it is very important that uh, the, the point, prime point which you take is end of induction, which is important. So these are the patients who's, who had an end, end of induction MRD negative. And when, when uh, end of induction uh, 2 MRD was done, that was also negative. Here, there are these two ones. Well, the first one is when MRD end of induction was positive, but end of, in, end, end of induction 2 was negative. The, set, the green line is for those where the MRD was positive for both. So you see that there is there is no difference as such whether your end, end of uh, uh, end of consolidation to MRD is positive or negative. So that is why in these cases of AML, in contrast to ALL, your end of induction MRD, if it is positive, then the the, the positivity at time point two does not matter. And this is true for everything, like for disease key survival, for overall survival, etc. So this is the current classification that we use, uh, or, or uh, the, the risk assignment that we use for uh, our standard of care. These are the prognostic favorable prognostic markers, uh, and these are the high risk markers. I will not go into detail, and this is the RAM phenotype other than the genetics. So these these are these are all considered as the high risk uh, high risk uh, molecular uh, markers. And this is the risk stratification that is used that is being used in the current COG trial. And you will see that there are basically two risk factors, uh, two risk uh, groups: low risk and the high risk. But the low risk is divided into low risk one and low risk two. The low risk one patients, they get four chemo courses, and those who are low risk two, they get five chemo courses. And that, that risk stratification, of course, as I mentioned, depends on clip 3 ITD, other activating mutations, favorable cytogenetics, unfavorable cytogenetics, RAM phenotype, and measurable disease. The important thing that you will see here that if your clip 3 ITD is positive only in those cases where you have uh, NP1, NPM1 or CDP alpha positive, even then you remain in, uh, in the low risk group and give, get five courses and you do not get uh, go to the, uh, to the transplant. Whereas in all other cases where you have uh, flip the ITD positive, then you take them to transplant. So these patients, the low risk patients, either get four cycles or five cycles of chemotherapy. Those patients who are high risk they get three chemo courses and then they go to transplant. So in our standard of care, we give induction one, that is the same 10 days of RSC, three days of uh, Dono, and five days of uh, etoposide uh, with gemtuzumab. And uh, then the low risk ones get three cycles, the high risk ones then get uh, another two cycles, and then if there is a donor, there, then allogenic transplant. If not, if there is no donor, then they get the consolidation too. So the question about four cycles versus five cycles. Five cycles. This was uh, done by COG, and they saw that those patients who had favorable risk cytogenetics uh, or molecular disease, if their MRD was negative, there was no difference between four cycles and five cycles, and that's why they were giving four cycles to this group. But then when they saw the MRD uh, was positive at end of induction one, 
then the disease free survival was with the, those patients who got four courses only 53% those who got five courses it was 70% so that is why that if your mrd is positive at end of induction then they give five courses <clears throat> now this is the a complicated looking slide this is the study al uh, 1831 it is currently running and here this is the de novo aml you give them uh, dono and uh, cytarabine with uh, with gemtuzumab uh, induction one and induction two is and the, on arm b you give them cpx 351 and i will explain what is the cpx 351 and after two cycles you risk assign again at low risk one and low and high risk one. So that is, but those patients who are flip free ITD uh, positive, they get similar treatment in addition to giltretinib, which is a, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And after finishing therapy or after transplant for high risk group, the giltretinib is continued for one year and as a maintenance uh, for for uh, whether you have. ITD or whether you have any other activating mutation, you continue on giltretinib for another year. So gemtuzumab, it is a self-surface antigen CD33, and this is the first one that was successfully uh, targeted with the, uh, with, with the antibody drug conjugate that is uh, ozogamycin. And it, as a single agent also, he, it had shown uh, efficacy in the threat of uh, relapse disease. And now it is a standard of care to, to combine it with uh, conventional chemotherapy. And this is what it shows you that those patients from low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk who received uh, gentuzumab or did not receive gentuzumab. So this is the low risk group where they, they did not receive uh, gentuzumab. And those are the ones who, uh, uh, sorry, these are the ones who received gentuzumab. The whole sorry, this is the relapse risk. They who did not receive gentuzumab, and this is the one those who received. In the intermediate risk, you will see that these are the ones who did not receive, and uh, vice versa. So it was clearly shown that gentuzumab is uh, effective. Now CPX351 that I mentioned, it is a liposomal formulation of a fixed combination of donorubicin and cytarabine. So it decreased. It has shown that it decreased cardiotoxicity in adults. And it had significantly improved outcome in older adults who were given actually in a phase three study CPX 351 versus seven plus three protocol. Uh, two clinical trials in children demonstrated the safety and efficacy. The uh, COG AML uh, 1421 for, uh, was for relapse patients where they received uh, CPX uh, 351 in first cycle and FLAG in second cycle. And the CR, including CRP, CRI, etc., it was about more than 70%. So the FRIT3 inhibitors are actually uh, type 1 or type 2 inhibitors, which is important to know because the type 1 inhibitors, they inhibit both ITDs and TKDs, whereas type 2 inhibitors, they, they uh, inhibit only uh, ITD and not TKD. So that is why in this protocol, we are using giltretinib instead of serafinib in this uh, trial. Uh, so in last trial, we used uh, uh, in uh, AML 1031, we used serafinib plus chemotherapy, and this is the outcome of serafinib. So these are the patients who were, who were um, FLIT3 3 positive, and uh, those who were exposed to serafinib, their, uh, their overall survival was 66%. Whereas those who did not receive uh, serafinib, it was only 55%. And similarly, if you see the relapse risk, it was it was 17.6% uh, for those who received serafinib and 44.1% who did not receive serafinib. So this, this efficacy was established here. These are the trials which are currently going on with uh, for FLIP3 inhibitors. And this is the red one that is there. It is a part of... Uh, this is the one that we are a part of it. Now, sorry. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Dr. Nakhvi, we are short of time. You have just three, four minutes. Then we yeah. have a second. Yeah, okay. I will finish in three, four minutes. Okay, hopefully. thank you. Yeah. So, Venito clocks, clocks is uh, uh, an inhibitor of BCL2. So, now BCT, BCL2 family of proteins, they regulate apoptosis. 
and AML blasts have an increased expression and are dependent on this protein for survival. So as a single agent, it has modest activity, but when it is combined with as a cytidine or with chemotherapy, it has been very pro uh, promising. So this was the first uh, phase one dose escalation, escalating study. And uh, on this even uh, phase one study for relapsed or refractory patients, the overall survival was seen as 69%. And uh, this was uh, another multi-center trial. Very recently, uh, this was published in Blood Advances for 31 patients, where it was given in different combinations that you see here. And just look at this one, uh, this that uh, the overall survival for those patients who were wished to stem cell transplant, the outcome, the overall survival was 75%. So these are the common uh, genomic targets that are associated with agents that are available commercially now. So these for FLIT3, BCL2, IDH, etc. And these are the active trials which are going on. Uh, for a relapse patient, this is uh, the, the state of the art that uh, just published in Hematologica that uh, the advice is that if it is a good risk one that is within less than 12 months, you, you can use in cycle one flag IDA or CTX and then cycle two flag at flip three inhibitor. If there is CR, go to his transplant. If no CR, go to venetoclax. If it is a relapse or refractory, start with venetoclax and go accordingly. So that goes, I think I will just, and these are the targeted therapies that are in study. So including the CAR T cell, for AML. So those are only said there is no actually clinically available uh, standard of care or clinically available other than the trials for, for AML CAR T cells. So that is it for now. And uh, I think, I don't know, I don't have time in front of me, so I'm, I'm not sure if uh, I went over time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nakvi, for an excellent talk. Uh, we will take question answers at the end of your second talk. Is it okay for you if you go with your second talk now and take uh, question answers at the end of your second talk and free you, or it's up to you as you are convenient? Uh, okay, I can do that. Or why don't you have the other talk? Let me just uh, have a minute and then uh, I, I'll be okay because the next okay. talk also will be about 20 minutes. So I, I should be okay. No okay, worries. thank you. Thank you. So the next one. So um, I am pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Mary, though she no needs no introduction. Dr. Mary is a graduate of King Edward Medical College, and she is working as consultant pediatric oncologist at Royal Marston since April two thousand and one, and she is a chair of uh, Children Cancer and Leukemia Group NHL Interest Group. And she has special interest in leukemia, lymphoma, and late effects of childhood treatment survivors. She would be speaking about the management of relapsed or factory Hodgkin lymphoma. Over to Dr. Mary. Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? So it's always a pleasure to attend the Shaukat Khanam Symposium. Lovely to see all good friends and also junior doctors, some of you uh, whom I know quite well. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to go straight at the treatment of relapsed, sorry, relapsed refractory no, Hodgkin's disease and as you are aware, most of uh, uh, Hodgkin's uh, disease treatment is risk stratified and the relapse treatment is also risk stratified and um, response adjusted as you go along. So the main uh, factors that determine um, response are the time to relapse, first treatment and the first line of treatment and the stage at relapse. And as I go on, I will uh, tell you how these determine the actual treatment we give these patients. So for quite a long time, over the last uh, 20 years. Okay. 
So over the last 20 years, the Euronet trials have uh, uh, brought about some prognostic factors which we are still using. And based on their first R1 uh, relapse strategy, these are the... Is my phobia? Is my phobia appointed? So, and these are the... Uh, this the, these are the things that we use to determine time for relapse. So primary progression is either primary refractory disease or relapse within three months of ending treatment. Late relapses when the relapse occurs after twelve months of coming off treatment. So, and then early relapse is that which occurs within three to twelve months of end of treatment. So this, as you can imagine, is very important in determining uh, how the patient will do subsequently and how we're going to treat them. So this uh, was the R1 strategy. Patients who had a relapse uh, after um, greater than 12 months in treatment group one were called relapse group one and were given treatment without autologous stem cell transplant. They were just given radiotherapy after four courses of standard chemotherapy, and they did not have a PET CT in between to determine response. Whereas patients who had progression or they had early relapse, all were potentially open to autologous stem cell transplant. Patients who had progression went straight down this pathway to beam-conditioned autologous stem cell transplant, and they had radiotherapy as well if there was delay in going into uh, complete metabolic response. And patients who were in complete metabolic response in the early relapse group went on to have just radiotherapy. So this was the protocol we were using uh, previously. So the, they, there have uh, been modifications to this guidelines since that time point. And this is because some of these groups have proven to be high risk. So patients who are now considered low risk are the ones who have either had a late relapse, which is greater than 12 months, or early relapse after treatment group three are not included in that group. So if they've had an early relapse, they are considered standard risk and not low risk. And if they have had a relapse in a previous radiotherapy site, you would also ex exclude that group because you don't want to re-irradiate them. Then stage four relapse is a systemic disease and they are also excluded. So regardless of what they had in the beginning, if they have, and the time point of relapse, if they have a stage four relapse, they are not included in the low risk group. And also, uh, if the radiotherapy fields are going to be huge, then it's better to give them autologous stem cell transplant the, rather than include them uh, in, the, in the low risk group. And then, PET is now, PET CT has uh, been found to be of highly uh, pro prognostic significance in uh, high prognostic significance in Hodgkin's disease. So it's done in all groups. And for PET um, uh, adequate response, we, we used to consider Doval 1 and 2 as being show, showing adequate response. But uh, um, now Doval 3 is also considered adequate response. And the goal of salvage therapy is to make sure that the patients are PET negative after a PET negative before autologous stem cell transplant because that too is of prognostic significance. So if we uh, break this down uh, into what it means, it means that if patients I mean, this is, I, uh, I know some of you are using Euronet protocols, so I hope uh, uh, you will forgive me if I use the same categorization. Uh, treatment level one were those uh, pa patients with, uh, with, with largely stage 1A and stage 2A, stage 1A, B, and 2 
A disease who were just given two courses of OEPA with or without radiotherapy and treatment level two were the ones who were given four courses of chemotherapy with or without radiotherapy and these had six courses of chemotherapy. So if these patients, if they progress, if they relapse within three months, they are considered standard risk, which means that they will need autologous stem cell transplant. The low risk groups are these, early relapse in treatment level one and two, and late relapses in uh, all these three categories. Early relapse with treatment level three are now standard risk, which means that they will need an autologous stem cell transplant. So again, this is just to reiterate the same thing. If you patients have uh, had a late relapse by and large and excluded from the categories I mentioned, these patients don't need an autologous stem cell transplant and they will just have standard chemotherapy plus radiotherapy. Standard risk are uh, most of the patients, 70% of them, and they will need um, uh, standard chemotherapy plus autologous stem cell transplant. And if there's been a delay in them getting into complete metabolic response, they may need post stem cell radiotherapy or maintenance brentuximab. Mm -hmm. The high risk group are those patients who don't go into complete metabolic response after two lines of treatment. So if you've given standard chemotherapy, for example, we use IGEV and they have, there's no adequate response. Then we've given them brentuximab and bendamustine and they still are not in CMR. Then they will go into this group and they will need novel agents. And then you might consider uh, giving... Uh, <clears throat> And you, you might take them autologous transplant if the residual disease is very small, but the results are not so, quite so good unless they are in complete metabolic response. So you may give them third or fourth line treatments before taking them to autologous transplant or allogeneic transplant in this group. And uh, obviously you could, you could give maintenance treatment after them because they, these are in a very high risk category. So treatment decisions are uh, in salvage, in relapse disease, consider, uh, are dependent on the original stage and disease bur burden in first line, which determines how you treat them, whether you treat them with less chemotherapy or not. And so the prior treatment, treatment level one, two, or three, plus or minus radiotherapy is actually dependent on the original stage. So these two are interlinked. Then the time to relapse is very important, progression early or late. This tells you the bio biology of the disease and if it is aggressive or not. And then the stage and disease burden at relapse, response to salvage, uh, chemotherapy is very, very important so that the PET that you do after two courses of treatment tells you how chemosensitive the patient is. And there is this, in relapse setting, there is a huge uh, pressure on the consultants to minimize the risk of relapse. And obviously, you still have to think of the side effects of treatment as well. So uh, the low-risk salvage group consists of... Uh, the things that we've already discussed, so I'm not going to tell you, uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but this is early relapse in treatment level one or two or late relapses in any of those groups, uh, provided that um, they don't have stage four disease or have not relapsed within the radiotherapy field. And then they must have a PET negativity after two cycles of treatment. So the treatment we actually give them, I mean, you can determine which chemotherapy protocol you use because there is no randomized trial to show that one is better than the other. And, uh, but we use say IGEV, uh, which is vinorelbine, ifosfamide, gemcitabine, and prednisolone. We give two courses of IGEV. We do an early response uh, assessment. And if the, patient shows adequate response, they get to two further courses and then involve field radiotherapy. Then the standard risk patients, again, uh, this comprises of everything that low risk is not. So primary progression, early relapse of treatment level three, as well as relapse within the radiotherapy and uh, um, inadequate response after two courses of treatment. 
So these patients, again, for these, we also use IGF. They have an early response risk assessment. And uh, if um, the early response assessment shows adequate response, they go on to the high dose therapy. If, uh, if they don't have adequate response, they get uh, bendamustine and brentaximab, and then they go on to autologous stem cell transplant. Obviously, if they have an inadequate response at this stage as well, then you will have to try novel agents and other treatments. So then we go on to um, high-risk patients. And even in these patients, the intention of treatment is to cure these patients because now there are several agents available and you can potentially cure these patients. I've got one or two case studies that I'll share with you and they will show that even after multiple lines, lines of treatment, you can have survivors. So this group includes patients who are in um, inadequate response after two lines of uh, salvage chemotherapy, and the five-year progression-free survival was in this group was 37% after autologous stem cell transplant. And that's why you have to try other lines of treatment before you take them to transplant. I mean, you can give um, autologous stem cell transplant in responding patients, but the results will not be uh, that good. So it's important not to abandon them, but most people would try further salvage chemotherapy or novel agents to, to achieve this PET adequate response and then do an autologous stem cell transplant. With both options, you can consider consolidation with maintenance brentuximab or consolidation uh, radiotherapy, or if you had a, a, or you could try a novel agents. So for us, we would give them two IGFs, and if there's inadequate response, you'd give, uh, um, uh, no, no, th this is, you know, they will already have had their IGFs and there's inadequate response. And so some patients could go on to uh, high dose uh, chemotherapy with autologous transplant, transplant, or more, uh, commonly, they'd go three uh, other lines of treatment before they go on to maintenance brentuximab or radiotherapy. So brentuximab, uh, uh, as you most most of you know, is an antibody drug conjugate, and uh, which is anti CD thirty that latches onto cells, and then the um, toxic agent kills the cells. So it is one of the newer targeted therapies, which has been found to be very effective in CD30 positive disease like Hodgkin's and ALCL. So Can the- Two, to three minutes. Two, three minutes. Okay. So this is uh, Brentuximab uh, Vedotin data, which showed a complete response rate of 82% uh, and overall response rate of 94%. This is the new PDL1 agents like nivolumab and pembrolizumab, which are very effective in Hodgkin's disease. This is this is just to so I I started off after nine, is it? Okay, so these are the, the com drug combinations that you could use, and uh, it depends on the familiarity with the protocols and make sure. You are not using agents that have an additive to toxic effect. And uh, um, uh, so you there's lots to choose from. So just going through these two case studies, you can see that uh, uh, this patient of mine had mixed cellularity disease, was given our standard treatment OEPA, and then ha had multiple relapses. We tried weekly when blastine, and then went on to uh, allogeneic transplant, uh, which uh, did not work in the first instance. Graft failure had another cord transplant, and she has been in complete metabolic response. So what I wanted to say is that if you keep trying, you can salvage these patients. This, uh, the side effects of treatment in these groups is high. She had huge doses of anthracycline. She's got renal failure because of uh, the multiple drugs she used and will probably need a renal transplant. She's got AVN, um, vincristine induced neuropathy and other things. Then this new patient uh, that I've just uh, treating now, she had a late relapse 
And because we had this open study of prombolizumab and she was very, uh, she's a teenager, she didn't want to have further chemotherapy. So she's on this trial and we'll take her to autologous stem cell transplant with less side effects, hopefully, than my other patient. So in conclusion, it's uh, relapse Hodgkin's disease is still curable. Not all children need stem cell transplant. Need for transplant is determined by previous treatment, timing to relapse and chemosensitivity. Allotransplant should be reserved for resistant disease or post auto relapses. And BEAM and CBV are the main conditioning regimes for autologous stem cell transplant. So this is where I attend. What I want to say is many, there are many treatment options. Don't give up too soon. I've talked about one chemotherapy regime, but there are several with similar kinds of uh, overall response rate and CR rates. And you should choose the one you are most familiar with and uh, looking at the other patient factors as well. And thank you very much. Just wanted to leave you with something different. So thank you. So sorry if I've gone over there. Any questions, please? Yes. At the end? Okay. The question at the after the after the next talk. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Ahmad Nakvi and he will talk on the childhood cancer survivors, what to expect after treatment. And we will take a question and answer session at the end of this talk. Uh, Dr. Nakvi, please start your presentation. Yeah, I will, I'll share the screen. Yeah. You see my screen now? Yeah. Yes, we can see. Okay. So, <clears throat> now this is the second talk that uh, I was asked uh, to do was uh, uh, about uh, childhood cancer survivors. And uh, as we know that uh, completion of treatment actually is uh, a very important milestone for the child, for the family, and for caregivers as well. And it is actually celebrated in many, many different hospitals and institutions. And in my hospital also, what we do is a, is a bell ringing ceremony. So the whole family comes and the child rings a big bell and everybody is around. So uh, that is a time of happiness. But unfortunately, the journey to cure uh, does not stop there. So there, uh, for the relevant question, of course, is that what to expect after treatment. And that is the topic that was given to me for this talk. Uh, now, again, these are the uh, disclosures. So during the past five decades, tremendous uh, uh, progress has been made uh, in, the treatment, in the outcome of uh, many different pediatric cancers. And as these, these, uh, in this slide that you see, that uh, some, like leukemias are more than uh, almost 90%, lymphomas 95%, renal tumors 90%, bone tumors 72%. So there has been tremendous, uh, actually, uh, uh, improvement with uh, with uh, all those uh, with all those development that has been made uh, in terms of uh, chemotherapy and supportive care. So more than eighty percent children who have access to these contemporary therapies are expected to survive and uh, uh, go in, uh, and uh, go into the adulthood. So with uh, these uh, these successes or these good outcomes actually come with a cost, and the cost is in the shape of adverse uh, uh, adverse long term health related outcomes. So those are known as late effects. These late effects can be seen uh, after a few months or even years after after finishing the team, uh, the, the treatment. So it is very important that after the child finishes his chemotherapy or radiotherapy or whatever modality you have given, but after that you have to follow this child uh, lifelong. So those childhood cancer survivors have to be on your list and there, most, there should be a clinic or a way that they, they should be followed up. 
Now, what are the domains of uh, uh, common day defects? So growth in development, organ dysfunction, reproductive capacity for both uh, males and females, secondary cancers, psychosocial uh, uh, late effects, and of course, premature death because of all the toxicities and, or, and uh, these secondary cancers included. So those are the domains which, which are very important. If we talk about uh, the uh, growth and development, it all depends at, at what age the child was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, so earlier the age, the more the more impact is on the growth and development of, of the child. For organ dysfunction, examples are there like cardiac toxicity seen with anthracyclines, uh, pulmonary toxicity seen with, uh, with uh, bleomycin, or the effect of platinum compounds on tearing and kidneys, uh, testicular tumors, testicular uh, involvement in, uh, in like leukemia. So all, all those organ dysfunction will later on uh, later on, uh, affect the uh, will come as late effects. Uh, reproducive uh, reproductive capacity can be compromised in both males and females, and especially those patients who have received like alkylator therapy or those who have received uh, radiation to either the abdominal or pelvic area or or even uh, um, head, because uh, then the neuroendocrine axis will be will be affected with that. Second uh, malignant neoplasm or, or secondary carcinogenesis, of course, when a child is di diagnosed, the first thing is their fear of relapse, but that is not enough. And after chemotherapy, uh, the, the, the other, other fear is of a second cancer that these children can develop. Again, certain chemotherapy drugs are more, uh, put a child more at risk to develop secondary cancers or especially uh, the radiation therapy. Now, psychosocial sequelae, uh, they can be related to treatment or maladjustment uh, with, uh, that is associated with uh, cancer experience. CNS radiation, for example, for uh, brain tumor or CNS positive leukemia patient, it, it is, it is uh, uh, another risk factor. So what are the factors responsible for late effects? There are cancer related uh, uh, factors there are treatment related factors and there are host related factors so cancer related factors of course if the if the organ itself is involved in the cancer uh, example being like uh, bone tumors and osteogenic sarcoma or retinoblastoma testicular cancers of course uh, the, the, that will result in late effects then the treatment related factors what type of treatment what modality was used so if radiation therapy was given, it depends on what dose was given, what fraction size was there, and how much volume was exposed, not necessarily the, the exactly the, the, the like uh, in the chest, if you are uh, you're exposing, then what are the area around that also gets exposed. For chemotherapy, again, and I have been mentioning many different uh, like uh, chemotherapies, like alkylators, et cetera, it depends or that what agent was used, what was the cumulative dose. So this is important always when a patient finishes treatment to calculate the cumulative dose of certain uh, chemotherapy agents that I will mention later on. Then of course surgery also plays some part, but especially the stem cell transplant, that uh, the late effects of the stem cell transplant and the most common and, and sometimes very dreadful is chronic graft versus host disease. In host related factors, uh, of course, uh, sex, like for female, uh, for females, they are at higher risk of adverse psychosocial late effects. Or another example could be uh, uh, like the osteonecrosis that we see, or AVN. It is more common in uh, uh, in um, females, teenager females, as compared to males of the same age group. Uh, Pre-morbid or comorbid uh, post-treatment health states will be like if somebody has already uh, uh, an, a history of depression or anxiety or autism, they will be more likely to develop some neurocognitive problems or uh, psychosocial problems. Uh, then, of course, uh, developmental status uh, I have already mentioned. The genetic predisposition, especially for second cancers, those patients who, ha who have these can cancer predisposing syndromes, 
they are more prone to develop along with their the risk of with the chemotherapy, but they have another reason for having second, um, second uh, like having those late effects. Socioeconomic status, because these people, they have, can have problems with access to, uh, access to the healthcare system, then of course, unemployment, relationships, etc. So those are the post-related factors. <clears throat> so this is, uh, uh, so to know the burden of how, how much burden of these uh, uh, late effects is, this is the St. Jude Lifetime Cohort study that they did on all patients, those who were treated at St. Jude's, and those who survived for 10 years or longer from the initial diagnosis, and were 18 years old or, or, or as of uh, their cutoff date. And they matched with age and sex uh, uh, in, the, in the community for age and sex. So they actually looked at 168 chronic health conditions. They made a list and graded it according to this uh, common terminology criteria of adverse events that all of us know, and we have a booklet for grading the side effects also. So there were more than 5,000 patients, and what they saw was that a survivor had experienced on an average 17 chronic health conditions of any grade, of which 4.7 were of a higher grade. And for NASH community control, it was 9.2 and 2.3. So you can see that this was at 50 years, so you can you can imagine that how many chronic conditions that these children these children can develop. Second neoplasm, spinal disorders, and pulmonary disease disease was the ma were the major contributors to the uh, total cumulative burden. And this was another study from the same same St. Jude lifetime cohort study. This was for those patients who were more than five years from their primary cancer diagnosis, and they looked at two different ages, 18 years. When, the, when there is a transition from pediatrics to adult uh, world, and at 26 years when the, when the insurance things change for, for children. So there were 4,000 survivors. And what they looked at was that 18, at 18 years, the survivors had at least 22 uh, disabling conditions per 100 individuals, whereas in control, they were only 3.5. And I will not go into more details because of time. So what was the what were the most notable uh, conditions or disabling conditions were the bone tumor, soft tissue sarcomas, and central nervous system. Those were the, the, the those were the uh, survivors of those tumors who had the maximum number of those chronic conditions. So let me go to the subsequent neoplasms. So these are the histologically distant neoplasms that develop at least two months after completion of treatment. Um, so these are the leading cause of non relapse late mortality, and there is a six fold increased risk of second neoplasms among cancer survivors compared to the general population. Now, this is a study because most of the studies that you will see, they report these second neoplasms five years after completion therapy. This is a recent study from Great Britain where they saw within the first five years the, uh, the, 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 the pattern and risk of uh, Second neoplasm. So there were 56,000 children that uh, they included in the in this in this uh, uh, paper. There were 52,000 were included in the analysis. So 224 children they developed subsequent cancer that is at 0.4 percent. And they saw that what they call it as simultaneous second uh, primary tumor. Within the first 91 days there were 24 cases. So Second neoplasms are very important. So this is another study. This is from Childhood Cancer Survival Study Group. So this was those children who were five years from their diagnosis, 22,000 survivors. And <clears throat> there were one third of those patients had received chemotherapy only. About 50% had received chemotherapy plus radiation and 10% each of radiation only, and then almost 9.7% were those who neither received chemo nor radiation. So what was the incidence, 30 year cumulative incidence of cancer, those received chemo only, 3.9%. Chemo plus reds, 9%, and radiation only is about 11%. 3.4% were those who neither received chemo nor radiations. So these are uh, what what were the cancers as uh, second tumors, but uh, uh, the risk for so breast cancer had a fourfold more increase, uh, more risk of uh, uh, as a secondary cancer. Now these are the 
chemotherapy uh, agents that you have to be careful about. So cyclophosphamide uh, or this alkylator, there is an equivalent dose of cyclophosphamide. There is a complex formula that you use to, to come up with the cyclophosphamide equivalent dose. If it is more than 10 grams per meter square, the, real, the relative risk is twice as compared to those anybody who has received one to two grams. Similarly, anthracyclines are also associated with second cancer. So if somebody has received more than 300 uh, milligrams uh, per meter square, there's a risk from 1.3%, 1.4%, and especially in, the, in females for breast, for breast cancers. Uh, BP16 or uh, etoposide, more than 4 grams, it puts a 1.4 uh, times higher risk for any second uh, malignant tumor. For platinum compounds, more than 75, 750 milligrams per meter square is three times higher risk. So very carefully, one has to calculate the risk. Now let's come to the cardiomyopathy. A cumulative dose of anthracycline, is more than 300 milligram per meter square, exceeds 5% risk of cardiomyopathy after two years. And in some cases, more than 10% by 40 years of age. So the risk factor is young age at uh, the time of exposure and concurrent chest or heart radiation. So you have to calculate the dose conversion for anthracyclines. So it, for doxorubicin, it is one. So just multiply these numbers with the actual dose. So if you are using mitoxantron 12 milligram per meter square, that will be like 48 milligram equivalent anthracycline dose. So, so this, uh, what, what strategies you can to take that less cardiac toxic agents and use liposomal formulation, as I mentioned, for CPX351 for AML. And uh, prolonged infusion time was for adults. That projection is something debatable, but still it is advised that if you are using more than 250 milligram per meter square, you should use that projection. And how frequent you should do the echocardiograms and, and follow them, it depends on the anthracycline dose and the radiation dose. So from no screening to every two years, I will not go into detail, but this is available on COG guidebook. Uh, this is about the anthracycline and the female uh, uh, breast cancers that I just mentioned. So this is anybody, uh, this is a patient who received more than 250 milligram percent cumulative incidence, and this is for those who, who did not receive any anthracycline. So, this is about the um, uh, fertility. Now, risk factors for male fertility are uh, like testicular cancer, higher cumulative dose of alkylators. So, if somebody has is, uh, received cyclophosphamide 20 grams per meter square or iphosphamide more than 60 grams per meter square, or combination with MOP, cyclophosphamide as conditioning for, for stem cell transplant. Uh, radiation, abdominal pelvis testis, those more than 20 grams. So they are, they are at high risk of uh, uh, problems with fertility. <clears throat> now, these alkylating agent doses that cause gonadal dysfunction show individual variations. So uh, this germ cell function or spermatogenesis is impaired at lower doses as compared to testosterone production. So all those things you have to consider. Now, this is for female uh, fertility. And uh, this is, uh, again, there are some patient factors. If the old age of treatment, or then what um, uh, cancer treatment factors are, again, the doses of alkylator and radiation uh, to either the, the, the ovarian scatter or ovarian radiation itself or to the neuroendocrine axis. So these are for the adverse psychosocial uh, and mental health disorders. Again, as I mentioned, female sex, younger age at diagnosis, family history of depression, anxiety, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then the cancer treatment factors are there, like bone tumor, CNS tumor, and the pre-morbid or comorbid condition on the patient uh, themselves. Also, these these conditions that you have to consider for a high risk of late effects. Uh, these are dental abnormalities. I will not go into detail, but these uh, are for acute myeloid leukemia or myelodysplasia that they develop with the use of these alkylating agents or heavy metals, etc. How periodic evaluation you should do. So this is there. Now these are the general recommendations for uh, follow up of, for, to, for to follow these patients, and they, it gives you that that what you should be doing on each visit. 
a detailed medical and family history, etc., nutritional, physical activity, consultation, advice on healthy lifestyle, screening question for anxiety, etc., fertility counseling. And this, this is from uh, this is a German uh, group that uh, has published this. And they have risk stratified into three groups. Group one is the low risk of developing late effects. And they say that attendance to clinic once every five years is, is uh, enough. So patients with surgery only accept brain tumors, standard risk leukemia patients without radiotherapy and non-heritable retinoblastoma. Group two is medium risk and group three is high risk of developing late effects, which can be like they have to be seen every year. So what we do in our clinic uh, for those patients, that for at least for leukemia, I can quickly say that once they finish treatment, we see in the same clinic, in our clinic every month, but then after three months, they are transferred to nurse practitioners uh, follow-up clinic, which they see every three months for one year and then every six months for a year and then on a yearly basis. At five years after treatment, they are transferred to long-term follow-up and then when they are 18, they are transferred to the adult facility and then they are seen like forever. So these are the recommendations that what examinations should be done for group one, like echocardiogram only for ALL patients every five years, lung functions for lung surgery, etc. I will not go into details. This is for risk group two. This is a very good article. I think if you can just uh, look at it. And uh, this is for group three and all going on. And this is a very important one. If you could just get this from JAMA, and put it in your clinic because it gives you the late effects related to radiation therapy, anthracycline chemotherapy, and alkylating agents to the whole body, uh, all the all the areas. So this is the list for late effects of radiation therapy. This is for late effects of chemotherapy, and this is very comprehensive. I think this is my last slide, and thank you very much. I think we should. Um, I hope I finished in time. Thank you very much, Dr. Nakvi, for excellent talk. Now we can take the question answers. We have a few questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, so I will request Dr. Mary to come on the rostrum and then we take the question. So the first question is for Dr. Mary. This uh, Dr. Rabia Wali has uh, placed this question that how effective is brentuximab as monotherapy in resistance and the relapse disease versus brentuximab and chemotherapy. So either as a monotherapy or combination with the chemotherapy? Yes. So brentuximab, I think as a monotherapy, the progression-free survival was about 37, 40%, something like that. But in combination with the bendamustine, the response, the overall response rate was 82% um, with event-free survival of 75% or something. So I think most people, uh, especially when they are using it as a second line treatment, use it as uh, in combination with bendamustine for which there is most data. And it's an outpatient-based treatment, very well tolerated, and we have used it quite uh, uh, regularly. Um, but brentuximab on its own has been used as maintenance therapy for a year after autologous trans stem cell transplant or autologous stem cell transplant and radiotherapy or allogeneic transplant in some patients. The case study that I was mentioning was my patient who was just multiply relapsed and she kept on relapsing and uh, even her treatment post allogeneic transplant showed some positive disease, which we treated with patchy radiotherapy. And she got, uh, I think, a year of nivolumab. We elected to give nivolumab, but brentuximab could have been used in the same situation as a single agent for maintenance therapy. But I haven't used it as a single agent to induce remission. So that's my experience. So, do all patients need to have auto transplant if they are in MCR after brentuximab treatment? Do we need to consolidate with auto transplant? This depends on the risk group, especially if they relapse with, say, stage four disease, or 
um, they are an uh, refractory or progressive disease, which is a very high risk groups, then we, we do give them uh, autologous stem cell transplant. The patients in whom we don't give autologous stem cell transplant are the low risk group. And that group is the one um, in which there is either a late relapse or they, uh, the relapse is not within the radiotherapy field or the relapse is not so extensive that radiotherapy would be um, will be too much with too many uh, too much toxicity. So in that group, we do recommend autologous stem cell transplant. But there is this whole group of patients which um, we call low risk who can be treated without autologous stem cell transplant. So it depends on how risky you think um, relapse is. And in patients who have extensive disease, you are thinking of more systemic disease than localized disease because radiotherapy works for localized disease. Is that what you were asking? Can we give radiotherapy instead of uh, autologous stem cell transplant? So you have to choose the patient. There are a group of patients in whom you can't, you don't need to give autologous stem cell transplant. But in that, those patients, we, we consolidate with radiotherapy rather than autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, Mia Abdul Rahman has posted a question. Can we get the recording at the end as we are were unable to note all the points? So hopefully after some time, these talks will be posted on the symposium website. Yes. So, and you, I can share my slides. Yeah. You can share my slides. Oh. So now we can take... I am Adil Inazi, student of second year MBBS permanent. So ma'am, during this summer vacation, I have worked on a project in which I have uh, highlighted 1065 differentially expressed genes in classical uh, relapse classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So uh, how do you see uh, like treatment by targeting those differentially uh, expressed genes? We can uh, skip the step to target Yes, yeah, so for, for Hodgkin's disease, we don't know enough about the molecular makeup, but we know that it's CD30 positive, so anti-CD30 um, dr uh, drug conjugates are being used, and brentaximab is the one that we have most experience with. And so, certainly we know that uh, Hodgkin's disease overexpress PD-1 uh, and PDL one and so um, uh, checkpoint inhibitors like nivolumab and prembrolizumab there is data for and we are using those more and more as I sh showed you that my most recent relapse patient who was a late relapse we, we've elected to treat her with uh, pembrolizumab as second uh, um, as a, as her second line treatment rather than chemotherapy. But you must remember that these checkpoint inhibitors have also got uh, side effects, which we are only now learning about because the, when we use these checkpoint inhibitors, there's an imbalance in the immune function and they get a lot of endocrine problems. They're supposed to be less in children as compared to adults, but we still need to know about side effects. So when, in a disease that is so curable, I think targeted therapies will come and they will be less toxic, but we need to know more about them. We just can't jump onto newer treatments. Thank you. I had a question for Dr. Nakvi. It's Halima from Troxkanam Hospital. Uh, can you hear me there, Dr. Nakvi? For sure. I can. Okay. Uh, so what are the Japanese doing different from CSG and the Europe, European groups that they have 80% survival for AML? Um, I don't think that they are using many different uh, uh, chemotherapy agents. I think they are, they, because they have like 30% of their uh, patients, they have uh, more favorable cytogenetics, as I showed you. So their, their biology is better than what we see in North America. But other than that, I don't think that there is a marked difference in terms of therapy. And my second question was for FLIT3 ITD patients. Um, yeah. If they go into 
to remission with one induction, do they still need to go on to transplant or can you consider conventional chemo? And also, if you don't have a matched sibling donor, would you consider haplo in first remission in someone with FLIP3 ITD? Yeah, so FLIP3 ITD, I just showed you that other than the, uh, if they do not have any any um, uh, favorable cytogenetics, they would they would still go to transplant even if they are MRD negative after the end of induction one. So they will. And uh, your second question was, sorry, what was that? If it if, would you do a haplo like if you don't have them because we can either do a sibling or a haplo in Pakistan yeah. we don't have a yeah yeah so yes of course if there's an uh, availability of uh, a related donor or uh, allergenic uh, uh, transplant is uh, uh, sorry not allergenic but if there is a related uh, donor is not there then haplo of course will be okay. And for Dr. Mary, I had a question for yeah. monitoring for relapse for Hodgkin's. What are the current recommendations that you guys, like how frequently are you doing imaging or how closely are you monitoring them for relapse? So excellent question, because the thing is um, Hodgkin's over 98% survival. So sometimes when you do too much surveillance, you hardly pick up any patient. So our traditional way of doing it was three monthly chest x-rays or three monthly chest X-ray and abdominal ultrasounds if they had disease in the abdomen as well. And then going on to four monthly in second year and then six monthly until five years of treatment. In our Among our adult colleagues, they were doing a PET CT at the end of treatment. And if the PET was negative, they weren't doing any further surveillance. Well, for in pediatrics, because we've been doing so much, so, late, so much surveillance, lately what we've started experimenting with is doing a PET CT at the end of treatment. And if that's negative, just doing three monthly chest x-rays for a year, because then the relapse is, risk is very, very small. And, um, uh, but, but, it, and that, but we would still clinically see them. But my worry is this chest uh, mediastinal lymph nodes, you're not going to see them, not, not, not going to feel them. So that's the thing. I mean, we, we in the past, people have been monitoring them with surveillance investigations too much. I mean, some people were doing CT scans as well. We were at least just doing chest x-rays and uh, uh, chest x-rays and abdominal ultrasounds. But my the, among the relapses that I know of, the, I had one relapse in 20 years, two and a half years after treatment. And so that's why... I think we feel that we are over uh, surveil doing over surveillance. So just to add on to that, um, um, so, so, so yes, exactly as you're saying. And I think what really needs to uh, be pointed out that it, there is a really strong requirement for a full physical examination. Yes, so physical So it's not just a thing. You've got to look at all lymph nodal sites in there as well. Mm. And, and also, you know, there was a very good study that came out about 10 years ago almost. Uh, from the US COG study that was done, which actually looked at how many times patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, relapsing patients with Hodgkin lymphoma was picked up by surveillance exactly. imaging. Yes. And it was like less than 10%. Very few. Because this my most recent relapse, for example, she has disease in multiple sites, but it's low volume disease. So she was having chest x-rays and ultrasounds, which did not pick it up. Then she developed a lymph node in the neck, which we biopsied. We did a PET scan and she had this small low level disease in multiple sites, including bone, which was totally missed by those. Well, I don't know. One doesn't know when that disease developed. Did it develop yeah. since the last surveillance scans or, or was it already present? Okay. So that's what I'm saying. This It's an excellent question. Okay. Uh, you, so I wouldn't do a CT, for example. Uh, thank you very much. We are running short of time. We can take rest of the question at the tea break time. So we will start the second session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nakvi, Dr. Mary, and all the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.